everyone, it's Sari, and I'm here live this morning at Higher Vision Church. Whether you're joining us through our website or YouTube or Facebook, we're so glad that you call Higher Vision your home. Now let's tune in to today's message here at Higher Vision Church. say that I'm just glad to be home. Can I take a deep breath right now? In fact, would you join me right now as we take just a deep breath and rest in the presence of the Holy Spirit as I offer a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your presence, for your power. Thank you that we have so much to be grateful for. We just take a a deep breath of your spirit. We just rest in your presence today. And we thank you that in you we live and move and have our being. And that today we can celebrate being together here at Higher Vision Church and experiencing the joy that comes with those circles and those relationships. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. Amen. Grab your source for scripture. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Again, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. I want to ask you a question that is often a pervasive question that sometimes we don't address because it seems somewhat selfish. And yet it's a very valuable question because it addresses the why behind the what. And it's the question, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Whether we really talk about it or not, we ask the question, why am I here? Uh, Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I in this relationship? Why am I working this job? Uh, Why am I a Christian? In fact, have you ever asked yourself that question concerning your faith? Why am I a Christ follower? Why am I a Christian? Why should I be thankful to follow Christ? Well, that's what I want to talk about today. In fact, if we only took that question and filtered it through the grid of our eternity, the answer is simple, it's easy. Why should I be a Christian? Well, because I want to spend the rest of my life in relationship, the rest of my existence in relationship with God rather than away from God. I want to spend my eternity in heaven with peace and tranquility rather than in hell where there's eternal torment. So heaven, hell, no brainer. It's heaven. So why should I be a Christian if it's merely because I've taken out an eternal fire insurance policy, the answer is easy. But let's take it a step further. Let's talk about it in the here and now, because for many of us, we understand we're we're living this life, and that question is important to us. Why should I be a Christian in the here and now and not just the sweet by and by? Let's look at our text. I think it offers some poignant ideas, some spiritual truths to help us. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In fact, would you read this with me, this phrase, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by, read it with me, glory and virtue by which have been given to us, again with me please, exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So let's ask the question, what's in it for me? Why should I be thankful as a Christian? If you're taking notes, if we go back to the very beginning We read these words, according to his divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. In other words, 
We have everything that we need to exceed in this life. I know that in this life, I don't have to succumb to being a failure. You don't have to succumb to being a failure. We're not threatened by the idea that we're failures because according to God's word, he's given us all things that we need to exceed. Now that's, that's helpful for us because in our performance-driven culture, there's this 500-pound gorilla that always seems to confront us, which is a 500-pound gorilla of failure, constantly saying to us, what if we fail? What if we fail as a parent? What if we fail at our jobs? What if we fail as Christians? Many of you know that I uh, am now serving in this very high-capacity, high-pressure role where I'm responsible for a global denomination in 66 nations of the world. And I can tell you that sometimes it's overwhelming and I feel like that 500-pound gorilla is staring me in the face saying, what if you fail? What if you make the wrong decisions? What if you make mistakes? What if you mess this thing up? And if I'm not careful, I, I start listening to that wrong voice instead of understanding that according to his power, he has given me everything that I need to exceed in life. All things that pertain to life and godliness, that I'm not dependent upon my own power, but on his power. That I'm not dependent upon my own skill set, but I'm dependent upon his skill set, which is so inspiring and encouraging to me because I can tell you sometimes we make mistakes and fail. In fact, one of the, the scriptures that is always encouraging to me is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27, and it says, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. The foolish things in the original text Foolish meaning morene, or it's where we get our English word moron. So God has sometimes chosen the moronic things of this life. Sometimes he chooses morons <laughs> to confound the wise. I, I know none of you ever feel like a moron. But I can tell you there are times that I felt this way. The other day I pulled up to the, the drive through I'm at Wendy's and I'm ordering a small chili and a medium french fry because I love to dip my fries in my chili. And I'm ordering a Frosty and I understand that I'm not speaking into the speaker, I'm speaking into a trash can. <laughs> so I'm looking around to see if anybody's seen me order in this trash can and I'm thinking I look like a moron right now I look like an idiot and then I go on this this road trip with my my friend and we stop at this gas station and we run in and then I come running out and I open the door of his truck to get in and all of a sudden I realize it's not his truck and it's not my friend sitting in the front seat giving me this look like you are a moron Because all of us experience that there are times that we we do moronic things and yet with God no one is a moron people in our world in our culture will label others as moron but with God he uses those of us who make mistakes and fail to confound the wisdom of this world he uses the things that seem like ultimate failures in our weakness. He is made strong. So what's in it for me? Why should I be thankful as a Christian? Because I have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Look at the next part. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Somebody say glory and virtue. Glory and virtue. Which means as a Christ follower, I have access to God's glory 
and God's virtue. Now sometimes the idea of glory in Scripture can be this complex spiritual truth. What, what is glory? But it's not really complex, it's simple. The word glory, doxa, simply means greatness. So when we're talking about greatness, we're talking about what somebody is famous for. What is LeBron James famous for? What is his glory? It's the fact that he plays basketball really well. What is Beyonce famous for? Her music. What is Tiger Woods famous for? Golf. What is God famous for? What is his glory? What is God's glory? Well, Moses asked to see God's glory, and God showed him his goodness. Moses said, show me your glory. God said, okay, I'll show you what I'm great at. I'm great at being good. I'm great because I am good. I, I know there was a sermon back in the 18th century that was preached in 1741 by this incredible British theologian by the name of Jonathan Edwards, and he preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which back then was perhaps a, a, a powerful sermon. But I think the theology of that needs to be tweaked, especially in the 21st century, because really if you read Scripture, the sermon title should not be Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, but Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. Sinners in the Hands of a Compassionate God, a caring God, a good God. What is God famous for? He is famous for his goodness. And because I am a Christ follower, now I have access to the goodness of God and to the virtue of God, which simply is, is talking about his moral excellence. I have access to his sovereignty. And I know when we talk about sovereignty, we, we have a tendency to head down the path that says, you know, God is sovereign because he can do anything. But that's not necessarily true. God can't do anything if it's outside of the scope of his moral virtue or excellence. God can't lie because he's not a liar. God can't deceive because he's not a deceiver. If you read the Old Testament, there were times that God wanted to do something, but he couldn't do it. He wanted to wipe the nation of Israel off the face of the map, but because, listen to this, he had made a promise to the nation of Israel that out of their seed would produce the Messiah. He could not go outside of the scope of his moral excellence and the promise that he had made to them to wipe them off of the map. So God is sovereign, not because of what he can do. God is sovereign because of who he is. We, we cannot talk about God's sovereignty within the scope of what he does. We talk about God's sovereignty in the scope of, of who he is. And because of who he is, I have his spiritual DNA, his seed because of a supernatural surprise me moment that took place in my life. And I was born again, making me a house of the Holy Spirit that now I have access to what he's famous for, his goodness, and access to what he's sovereign for, his moral excellence. So as much as I would want to pinch your head off at times, I can't do that because now I have the nature of God, the goodness and moral excellence of God working in me that does not allow me to function outside of that scope. I may want to live in unforgiveness towards you because you offended me, but I can't do it because now I have access to his glory and his moral virtue. I may want to live angry at you, but I can't do it because I have access to his glory and virtue 
that keeps me moving toward him rather than away from him. Hallelujah. So what's in it for me? Why should I be thankful at Thanksgiving? Why should I be thankful as a Christian? Because I have access to his glory and his virtue. You want to keep going? Let's look at the scripture. Do you want to keep going? All right. By which, by which his glory and virtue, because of his glory and virtue, I have been given or have been given to us, say it with me, exceedingly great and precious promises. What's in it for me? I have God's exceedingly great and precious promises in my life. You have God's great, exceedingly great promises in your life. The word great in the Greek is the word megastos, mega, great promises. Has God ever made a a promise to you that you know down in the inner recess of your heart that come rain, come shine, whatever it is that you're going to experience that promise. That maybe it's a promise that your spouse will be saved or your kids will be saved or a promise that you'll get that promotion or you'll build a great business or you'll travel to a a foreign land or you'll do a foreign missions trip or, or you'll serve in a great church, but God has made a promise to you. And here's the thing, when Daddy God makes a promise... He keeps it. In fact, it doesn't matter how big the problem is. The promise maker and the promise keeper is always bigger than the problem. When my boys were playing baseball in high school and I had Garrett and Spencer both playing on the varsity baseball team, I promised them that I would get them a bat. Of course, going through Little League and all of that, you're always getting the latest equipment. And so I made a promise that I would get them a bat. They knew that no matter what, Dad would buy the baseball bat and keep his promise. Now, I never took Kimberly with me because I didn't want her to know I was spending $299 on a baseball bat. And I told my boys, do not tell your mother that we are buying a baseball bat for $2.99 or $3.99. She'll never understand that. But even if I walked into the store and there were no baseball bats, that what, what we were wanting was not there. It didn't matter because my sons knew that the problem was not bigger than the promise. It didn't matter whether the baseball bat was there or at another store. They knew that dad had promised and dad would deliver. You know where I'm going with this. When dad, spiritually speaking, makes a promise to you, our heavenly father, the problem is never bigger than the promise. The problem is not a game changer. The promise is the game changer. The problem is not a surprise. In fact, when God gave you the promise, he already saw the problem at the same time. Can you imagine Noah building an ark for 120 years? Building an ark that was nowhere close to a sea. Spending 120 years of his life Building an ark with no water in sight. What do you do when you build an ark in the dark? What do you do when your friends are ridiculing you and saying, why don't you come and party with us because your boat's not going to float? What do you do when you have a bout with doubt or you're losing your mind because you're losing your dream? What what do you do when you feel like the promise is farther away from you than when you first started? When the promise seems so big, can I just remind you that you consider 
how big your God is. That you consider how great God is, how great the promise maker is, how great the promise keeper is. You know, we sing the song, what a beautiful name it is. And we get to that part and we actually sing this to God, don't we? You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever our God reigns. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a beautiful name it is. And we are singing that to God. You have no rival. You have no equal. When in all actuality, he doesn't need to be reminded of that. (laughs) He knows how big he is. He knows how great he is. We're not really singing that to him. We're singing that to ourselves. We're the ones who need to be reminded in the midst of the valley, in the midst of the problem that he has no rival. He has no equal. Now and forevermore, our God reigns. We're the ones reminding ourselves of how big God is and how small our problem is. I I think I need to remind somebody right here in this room right now. You may think you have a great big problem in a great big way in a great big moment of your life, but you're serving a great big God who loves to show up in a great big way in this great big moment of your life right now. God is great, and His promises are exceedingly great, and His promises are exceedingly precious. They're costly. They're priceless. How precious is your promise? Is it too precious to give up on? Because I found that people who give up on their promises probably don't value their promises enough. Because if your promise is that precious, the problem won't frustrate the promise. The promise will frustrate the problem. If your promise is that precious, you'll spend 120 years building an ark in the dark just to save your family. When your promise is that precious, you'll run down a hill with a rag and a rock in your hand to face a giant because you know what you're doing is going to save your nation. When your promise is that precious, you're not going to stay up on the mountaintop in the security and safety of the supply camp. You're going to run down, descend into the valley because you know that you have to go through the valley to get to your promise. You have to go through your obstacle, through your giant to get to your promise. That you can't stay up on the mountaintop in the safety zone, but you've got to run down the hill and declare, you come to me with a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I will experience my promise. When your promise is is that precious, The hero in you will not be controlled by the human in you. When you have that kind of promise, it is so precious to you. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you will not be controlled by the carnal nature that's trying to rise up in you. When the promise is that precious, the precious nature of the promise will overcome the persistent effort of the problem. I just dropped a spiritual bomb in this place. When it's that precious, maybe I should say it again, the precious nature of your promise will overcome the persistent effort of your problem. Because your problem's going to keep standing up in in, in the valley and saying, I defy the armies of the living God. I defy the God that you serve. I defy the promise that he's given you. And that's when that persistent nature of the problem is overcome because that promise is so precious to you that you're willing to descend into the valley, which, by the way, where is God? 
if he's not in the valley. If he's not with the broken and the contrite. If he's not with the morons and the foolish things of this world. Where, where is he? The Bible says that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He's right there in the valley. So when your promise is that precious to you, you'll be willing to go through the valley because he is a promise maker and a promise keeper, and he is a heavenly father who keeps his promise. Amen. All right, we're at the end of the movie. Are you ready? Let's get the, the resolve that through these, through what? The exceedingly great and precious promises. So let's just, let's just say it as it is, that through these exceedingly great and precious promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Somebody say divine nature. Divine. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What's in it for me? Why should I be thankful at Thanksgiving? Why should I be thankful as a Christian? Because I have his divine nature. God's promises are great. But can I say that God doesn't give us those great promises just to bless us. He gives those promises to us, listen, to produce godliness in us. Because we're pursuing the promises, we're moving closer to God. Those precious promises, those great promises are are working his divine nature in our lives. So it's not just blessing us, it's producing godliness in us. And I love it. Why? To escape, to open up the cage and let us escape the corruption that is in the world through less corruption. In the Greek, which talks about deep moral deterioration. If you haven't noticed, our world spiraling toward deep moral deterioration. I mean, turn on the, the television for even an hour, and you're hearing stories of, of innocent people being shot, being killed. We heard the testimony. You're hearing about corruption in politics. You're hearing about immorality in the priesthood. You're hearing about all of these types of things to the point that you just almost feel so dirty you want to just turn off the television. It's like you've walked out into the backyard when I was here in Santa Clarita. Walked out in the backyard and stepped in some doggy do. Walked back into the house, not knowing I had doggy dew on my shoe. My wife could smell it. She wasn't happy that I was tracking dog dew into the house. She could smell it. We eventually could see it. It was the residue of deterioration. I'm telling you, you can spend enough time in the backyard of this world and you'll start smelling like the world. And you'll start walking with the residue of this world on your shoe, tracking this world everywhere you go. There's a, there's a distinct smell to the corruption, the deep moral deterioration that that is happening in our world to the point that it, it becomes lust or deep immoral desire. The Bible calls it the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But what it is really involves sin. And we can get into a, a long discussion about what sin is, that it's this list of do's and don'ts. Don't do this, do that, do this, don't do that. But really, sin is not about a, a list of do's and don'ts. It's about resistance and distance. It's about resisting God and distancing yourself from God. So, when we have His divine 
nature working on the inside of us, we are escaping the corruption that is in the world through lust. He's opening up the cage and letting us out because now we're getting closer to God and his divine nature. And in the process, we're escaping the corruption that is in the world through lust. People become so consumed with a, with a sin. They're consumed by this sin, this thorn in the flesh that it just overwhelms them. And I want to say to them, if you want to overcome the sin, just get closer to God. Because the closer you get to his divine nature, the farther away from that weakness, from that sin, the distance will begin to to be there and you will get closer. You'll close the gap in your relationship with God. And you'll experience his divine nature or his divine character. What is character to you? How would you define character in your life? I I like the definition that character is the echo of your life. It's the echo of your life. It's it's what resonates off of you, out of you. Sound echoes off the walls of this auditorium. Whether it's speech or music, sound, the sound waves will echo off the walls. Character echoes off the walls of your life. You ask somebody, what do they think about when they think about you? What do they remember about you? Probably, for the most part, they're going to remember the echo of your life. The character of your life. If you have God's divine nature that's working in you, that's what they're going to remember. My hope and my prayer is that that when people remember me, the echoes of my life, they're remembering. You know, Wayman Ming was a godly man. There was divine, God's divine nature was working in his life. Because the greatest gift that I can ever give as a leader, a spiritual leader, as a pastor, as a bishop, is the acknowledgement that I have a personal intimate relationship with God that he is working divinely his character as it work in my life the echo of my life is his divine nature or his divine character what's in it for me why am I thankful that I'm a Christian well that's the question we ask in the opening scene of the movie It's because he's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We don't have to live as failures, but we have everything we need to exceed. What's in it for me? His glory, his virtue, access to what he's famous for, his goodness, access to what he's sovereign for, his moral excellence. What's in it for me? His exceedingly great and precious promises that work godliness in my life, that keep me pursuing Him, that allows me to experience His divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's not an answer for eternity or for the sweet by and by. That's an answer for today. What's in it for you? Why should you be thankful as a Christian or as a Christ follower? Because these things are functioning in your life. You have access to all of these things right now. I just want to remind somebody in this place, you're not going through the motions. You're not just living a a dead life. As the walking dead, you have all things that pertain to life and godliness. You have his glory and his virtue. You have exceedingly great and precious promises. And you have his divine nature at work in you. And all of God's people said,